Hello again, this is Father Ditomo, uh, again with our series, Married in the Church. And this is video three, where we will discuss uh, marriage and the reception of the sacrament of the Eucharist. So let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we ask you to help us to uh, reflect on the truth of the sacrament of marriage and what you are calling us to do as disciples. Even when we hear challenging things, help us to know that you are with us. Send your Holy Spirit to lead us into the kind of life that Jesus Christ desires for us. We ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So, how about receiving the Eucharist, with receiving Holy Communion? You know, the Church teaches us that we must receive Holy Communion worthily. And now we could always ask, who is ever worthy enough to receive Holy Communion? Well, who's holy enough to receive Holy Communion? None of us are. When you think about what Holy Communion is, Holy Communion is the body, blood, soul, and divinity, the real presence of Jesus Christ, present under the appearances of bread and wine. What an amazing gift of God's grace that is. Who could ever be worthy of that? In fact, at Mass, what do we say when the priest holds up the Blessed Sacrament before communion? We all say, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. I am not worthy. So none of us are worthy. That's the first thing to think about. None of us are deserving. None of us are holy enough. And yet, if we are baptized and have reached the age of reason and have been suitably prepared, we can receive Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. It's not required that we be in a state of complete moral perfection to receive Holy Communion. And praise be to God for that, because we seldom are. Uh, however, what is required is that we must be in a state, a basic state of grace. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states the following, Anyone conscious of a grave sin must receive the sacrament of reconciliation before coming to communion. That's paragraph 1385. And as a little review, what is grave sin or mortal, mortal sin? Mortal sin means an offense against God and or another person that is so serious that it's mortal. It, it, it kills the, the, the life of grace within us. And what are the, qualifi or the qualifications for something being a mortal sin versus a, a, a smaller venial sin? Well, a mortal sin has to concern serious matter, for one thing. So the Ten Commandments would be grave matter. Um, thou shalt not kill. Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, worship the Lord your God on the Sabbath, the holy day. Um, these are all parts of the, the, the Ten Commandments, which are uh, grave, grave matter. So first of all, it has to be something serious. It has to be grave matter. Secondly, we have to have full knowledge. We have to know that something is seriously wrong um, when we commit it. And then the third criteria for something to be a mortal sin is uh, we have to be free in giving our consent to it. We have to have freely chosen to do it. Um, you know, in, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 27 to 29, St. Paul writes this, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So right there we know that just because someone receives communion doesn't mean they're going to receive grace. In fact, they might actually be committing a sacrilege if they're not in a, in a proper state of grace to receive communion. So now since we're talking in these videos about relationships, uh, as an example, if you are you know, habitually having sex outside of marriage, for example, you're going to want to repent from that and go to confession before you can receive Holy Communion with the intention, too, that you're going to avoid that sin in the future, to do the best you can to avoid it. Um, if you are not able to go to confession, maybe, because you are living with someone and you do not intend to change your behavior, well, then it would be a good idea at that point to, to speak with a priest about your situation, uh, how you can change it, how you could grow, how you could take that next step. 
uh, in your spiritual life. At this point, some people might say, well, you know, I'm living with my fiance or boyfriend or girlfriend, but we're going, we made the decision, we're going to practice chastity until we are married. That's good. That's an excellent thing to do. Um, someone else might say, well, I was married outside of the church and I simply need to have my marriage blessed in the church. Now, a more proper uh, term for having your marriage blessed in the church is what we call a validation or um, it's sometimes it's called a convalidation. Um, the next video we will discuss that, how, how we take a marriage that is invalid and make it valid uh, through the, the church. And that there is a process for that, of course, and it does take some time, but it's not a very difficult process necessarily, depending on your situation. It's certainly something, ask your priest, ask your parish priest to help you with it. Uh, now, until the validation, such a person can uh, either abstain from receiving Holy Communion or choose to practice chastity until the time that they have their marriage validated within the Catholic Church. Um, the Church, relying on sacred scripture, has always taught, of course, that divorce is not a good thing. Uh, why? Because it goes against the lifelong fidelity that is an essential aspect of marriage. However, those who have experienced divorce, and if that includes you who are watching this video at this very moment, those who have experienced divorce are still a part of the Catholic Church. Okay, You're not kicked out of the Church. Uh, God still loves you. The Church still loves you and wants to help you. Uh, and of course, you know, very few people, I would say very few people get married intending to later divorce. Um, sometimes sad and tragic things transpire in a marriage. Uh, and I always urge couples, first of all, to reconcile with each other. If there's any way possible that you can reconcile with your ex-spouse or the person you've separated from, to pursue that. Um, seriously pursue that. You know, at the end of the day, you're going to want to stand before God and be able to say that you did absolutely everything that you could in order to save your marriage. You're not going to want to leave anything undone that you could have done but didn't do. You wouldn't be able to say you've done everything you can to save your marriage. Um, sometimes it's impossible for a couple to, to resume living again as husband and wife, though, for various reasons. If a man or a woman is divorced but living a chaste life, there's absolutely no problem receiving the sacraments of reconciliation and Holy Communion. Some people don't realize that. If you're divorced but you haven't remarried, you're, you're living a chaste life, you can receive the sacraments. Okay. Um, now others might say, well, I did not marry in the Catholic Church because I wasn't able to marry in the Catholic Church because I'm divorced. You know, I already married another person. We married in the Catholic Church and then we got divorced. And it was tough. I mean, maybe um, your, your, your ex-spouse cheated on you or was verbally or even physically abusive or abandoned you. But then you say, but you know, later I found love again and I, I married again and I found a good person to spend my life with. And you know, I, I had to raise a family. I wanted a companion. Um, we could be sympathetic with that. that, that those, those desires and are totally understandable. But again, we, we, we still have to also consider the truth, and the truth is that that prior bond, that first marriage, is still presumed to exist. Um, Jesus, you know, Jesus taught about the indissolubility of marriage. This is not like a, the Catholic Church, uh, Catholic Church teaching on divorce uh, and remarriage is not is like, you know, uh, some, some odd Catholic law or unique, um, you know, Catholic a belief it's it's taking from the Gospels uh, when Jesus was asked about divorce he clearly taught the indissolubility of marriage in, in the 19th chapter of Matthew if you have a Bible go pick it up and open it up and take a look at it in Matthew 19 the Pharisees were testing Jesus and they asked him is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause and this is what Jesus said he answered have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. So they are, they are no longer two, but one. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. 
Jesus goes all the way back to the beginning of the book of Genesis to go back to God's original plan for marriage and for the lifelong fidelity and the indissolubility of marriage. And then he says, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for unchastity, whoever divorces his wife, except for unchastity, and marries another, commits adultery. And he who married a divorced woman commits adultery. Uh, and that word adultery is a, is a very heavy word. We usually think of it only in terms of, well, if you're cheating on somebody. Um, well, entering into a second marriage when you still have another spouse is, is adultery, uh, technically. You know, we're just looking at what, uh, what our Lord says, and we're just praying for the grace to be able to understand it and to be open to it. And so you see this is not about the Catholic Church having a unique teaching or being just strict about, um, about divorce and remarriage. A lot of non-Catholic Christian communities don't hold to this teaching. And so the Catholic Church kind of is seen to be strict, but it's really just being faithful to the gospel, right? Um, no, the, 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 this is a teaching of Jesus Christ, and the church has to be faithful to it. The church has no other option, uh, no, however challenging it is. Remember this, Jesus said, the truth will set you free. So let's never be afraid of the truth, even if it's, it can be scary sometimes. Let's not be afraid of it. Let's keep moving forward. So what is indissolubility? Indissolubility means that the bond that is created in a valid marriage is permanent. And it only ceases with the death of one of the spouses. That's why a prior valid marriage prevents someone from marrying in the church. Because you, can't, you cannot marry someone when you already have a spouse. And despite what uh, the civil divorce says, you are still married to your ex-spouse in the eyes of God and the church. The, the state says you're, you're no longer married, but there's no authority there, ultimately. Um, in the eyes of God, the marriage is still presumed to exist. And you're still required to be faithful to them. Even if they were not faithful to you, or even if they left and got married again, you know, there's still the vow that you took at the altar. Uh, in 1981, uh, Pope St. John Paul II wrote in his apostolic exhortation, uh, Familiaris Consortio, the role of the Christian family in the modern world, the following words. The church reaffirms her practice, which is based upon sacred scripture, of not admitting to Eucharistic communion divorced persons who have remarried outside of the church. They are unable to be admitted thereto from the fact that their state and condition of life objectively contradict that union of love between Christ and the church, which is signified and affected by the Eucharist. That's paragraph 84. So what's John Paul II saying there? He's saying the Eucharist is centered on Jesus' love for his bride, the church. And his love was faithful. It was faithful to the end. And so if a person is not being faithful to their true spouse, then there would be a contradiction for them to receive the Holy Eucharist, which is all about Jesus' faithful love to his spouse. So stop right here and ask yourself, this is very important to do. Why do I want to receive the sacraments? Because if you want to receive the sacraments, you want a good thing. But we have to stop and say, why do I want to receive the sacraments in the first place? Um, some want to receive the Eucharist because they think that they have a right to it. Um, but none of us, none of us have a right to the Eucharist, right? It is God's gift of grace. Uh, it is a free gift, but we do have to be properly disposed in order to receive it. And, you know, even at Mass, when you go to Mass, not everyone has a right to receive Holy Eucharist. Um, uh, children who have not made their first communion yet, they don't receive communion. Uh, those who are uh, not Catholic yet, uh, but maybe they're studying to be Catholic or uh, they're uh, preparing for baptism, well, they can't receive communion yet. There, there's no right to communion. It's about uh, being disposed well for it, for that sacrament. Now, some might wish to receive Holy Communion because... Simply, they don't want the embarrassment of remaining seated in their pew while everyone else goes to communion. This is totally understandable. Uh, understandable. A lot of people don't want to be the only one sitting in the pew when everyone else goes to receive Holy Communion. You know, it's not a prescribed uh, ritual in the church. It's not in the, in the uh, uh, Roman Missal to do this. But a common practice in many churches is for a person to go to the priest at communion 
uh, and, and cross their arms as a way to show that they are simply asking for a blessing. It's actually not part of the rubrics of the Mass, but uh, it is a way that a lot, of, a lot of parishes allow people to go up and um, they can't receive communion, but they're able to receive a blessing. Um, maybe they don't stand out by just sitting down. Um, some, of course, wish to receive Holy Communion because they want communion with Jesus, which is the best reason to want to receive Holy Communion. And so they recognize the amazing gift that is Holy Communion, and they, they wish to be close to our Lord. They want to and need the strength that comes from that sacrament. They say, I need the grace of the sacrament. I need the grace of the Eucharist to live my life. Well, that is great, and they are right. However, again, again, we have to stop and ask ourselves, okay, why do I wish to receive Holy Communion again? Why do I wish to receive Holy Communion again? So that I can be close to the Lord. Good, good answer. But the best way, the best way to be close to the Lord is to seek to do His will. To do His will. And to conform one's life to the commandments and to the call of holiness that comes with baptism, uh, that call of being a disciple of Jesus. That's the best way to be close to the Lord. By saying, Lord, what's your will for me? And so, you know, the easy thing, and I'm telling you this as a priest, the easiest thing in the world would be for the priest to just ignore the situation, uh, for the person in the pew to just ignore the situation, and for everyone just to receive Holy Communion and act as though everything's just fine. Yeah, that'd be a lot easier for everybody. However, the reality is the person's life situation is, is, is causing a block, is impeding their reception of grace. And as a priest, that's when I have a problem because I've, I'm committing malpractice uh, because I want that person in the pew to receive as much grace as they can. And, I, and meanwhile, I, so I can't just look the other way when they come and I know there's something impeding the grace. I got to address it. We need to address it. I want to address it so that they can have more grace in their lives. You know, if you went to a doctor, would you want the doctor to tell you that everything is fine if you had you know, 90% blockage in an artery? Well, of course, no one wants to hear that there's a problem. Maybe part of you would say, yeah, I don't want to hear him say, like, you know, you're this close to having a heart attack because that's going to scare us. We don't want to hear that. Don't tell me any bad news. But really, at the end of the day, I don't want to hear that serious surgery is required. I'll get scared of surgery. But at the end of the day, wouldn't you rather know that something's wrong so that you can do something about it to be healthier? To, to live longer, to live more fully. God wants so much for us. God wants so much grace, so much happiness. He wants to take us out of our situation of sin or any kind of block to his grace and bring us into his life of grace. That's what he wants for us. You know, Jesus said, you know, I came to give them life and to give them life to the full, the abundant life. It's not, is that always easy for us to do? No. It might include some difficult decisions that we have to make and some work and facing some things, but it's worth it. So first, ask yourself this question. If I cannot receive the sacraments of confession and the Eucharist, well, then what can I do in order to be part of the life of the church? Am I just abandoned? Is it like I, I, there's nothing I can do to be part of the life of the church? No. There's a lot of things you can do. Because if you're married outside the church, you are not... You're not excommunicated. You're not cut off from the life of the church. The church is there for you. Um, listen again to these words of the great Pope St. John Paul II. He addressed this question in um, Familiaris Consortio. I earnestly call upon pastors and the whole community of the faithful to help the divorced and with solicitous care to make sure that they do not consider themselves separated from the church. For as baptized persons, they can, and indeed must, share in her life. They should be encouraged to, and these are the things you can do, they should be encouraged to listen to the Word of God, to attend the sacrifice of the Mass, to persevere in prayer, to contribute to the works of charity, and to community efforts in favor of justice, to bring up their children in the Christian faith, to cultivate the spirit and practice of penance 
and thus implore day by day God's grace. Let the church pray for them, he says. Encourage them and show herself a merciful mother and thus sustain them in faith and hope. Look at all these things we could do to grow day by day and implore and beg God's, God's grace and receive God's grace. St. John Paul II also wrote in the document uh, Reconciliation and Penance um, that the supports of acts of piety apart apart from sacramental ones. So you got the sacramental uh, reception of the sacraments, but then apart from that you have acts of piety, prayers, devotions. So the support of acts of piety apart from sacramental ones, a sincere effort to maintain contact with the Lord, attendance at Mass, and the frequent repetition of acts of faith, hope, and charity, and sorrow, made as perfectly as possible, can prepare the way for full reconciliation at the hour that providence alone knows. When you do these things, these acts of piety, maintaining contact with the Lord through daily prayer, attending Mass, you know, the, the acts of faith, hope, and charity, which are beautiful prayers, where we're asking for more faith, hope, and charity. Uh, and those things can prepare the way for reconciliation. Maybe your situation seems really difficult. How am I going to get there? And God, God can do anything. God can do all things. I want to also mention this point, Eucharistic adoration. What a beautiful thing. If your church has a, an adoration chapel, and if you're not able, because of your situation, to receive Holy Communion, go to Eucharistic adoration and pray before the Blessed Sacrament. Stare at our Lord um, in the Most Holy Eucharist, the Blessed Sacrament, and exercise your desire for Him. Tell Him how much you want to receive Him. Ask Him to help you to have your situation, have, have any obstacles removed so that, that communion can be possible again. Boy, when you exercise that desire, that's a purifying thing. That's going to be something that's going to make you stronger in your faith, hope, and charity. More stronger than just if you just were to receive Holy Communion um, just because you, know, you wanted to or just so you wouldn't stick out. But you're not really addressing the things the Lord wants you to address. So even if you cannot receive Holy Communion, this is important. Please still attend Mass uh, and worship God. Worship God as best as you are able to at Mass. You know, you can still obey the Third Commandment. You can honor God by keeping that commandment and keeping holy the Lord's Day while you are praying and seeking the will of God in hopes that a path to the sacraments will one day open up again for you in the future. You know, I think the idea has kind of cropped up in our culture the last, you know, 50, 60 years that if I go to Mass, I have to receive Holy Communion. Otherwise, there's no point to going to Mass. Well, that's a ridiculous notion. Of course, the Eucharist, you know, it, it's, it's fulfilled in the reception of Holy Communion. It, it, Holy Communion is supposed to be part of Mass. But, but the idea that if you can't receive Holy Communion, then there's no point to go into Mass is a terrible thing to think. Uh, it's very, it's false. Uh, it's a tragic thing because you're still at Mass. You're still worshiping while the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that happened one time in history is made present again on that altar. You're there at that moment of that outpouring of God's love and you're hearing the Word of God and you're getting direction for your life. Um, there's so, you know, why would you not want to do that even if you couldn't receive Holy Communion? You'd be denying yourself so much. Um, some people who cannot receive the sacrament of Holy Eucharist respond also by leaving the Catholic Church. This is a sad thing. They go to a Protestant church um, so that they can receive Holy Communion. No disrespect to my uh, Protestant brothers and sisters. A lot of respect for other Christians. Um, but if you're Catholic, again, you got to stop and ask yourself, is this church that I'm going to, yeah, I go to this church and they don't care if I'm divorced or remarried. They don't care. You know, they just say, welcome, come, receive communion receive the Lord's Supper. Um, but is that the church that Jesus founded? And, and does their belief about the Eucharist match what I believe? If it doesn't, why are you going there? Just so you can go through the act of, of receiving, you know, a symbol uh, of Jesus. Um, you know, the Eucharist is not, a, it's not just a symbol. It's the real presence. And that's in the Catholic Church. And so why, don't give up on that just because you have a situation that's difficult right now. 
Um, it would be better to say, Lord, help me to be humble. Uh, I will remain obedient to you and to the church that you founded. Well, what a great thing to offer God, that humility and that obedience. What a great offering. Help me to continue to pray and worship and help me to do what I need to do in order to be able to one day again receive the sacraments. And I just entrust that situation. Say that to the Lord. I entrust it to you. Um, I believe that that disposition would be more pleasing to God and would bring more grace to a person than if they just continued to receive the sacraments unworthily or left the church. Um, in the next video, we're going to discuss two ways that people can rectify their irregular merit, uh, marital situations. Um, the two main reasons, the two main paths, I should say, is a simple validation ceremony or a simple convalidation. And then the second is the formal marriage tribunal case process. This is commonly, though improperly, known as the annulment process, but we're going to talk about that. Also, if you are not baptized, there are a couple things. Uh, the Petrine uh, privilege, the Pauline privilege, there's a couple things that uh, ways that you should talk to your priest if you have a previous marriage and you want to become Catholic, but you've been married before. There's a couple unique situations that are unique to the, to the unbaptized that you should talk to them about. They'll help you out with that. So let's keep praying. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for everyone who's watching this video and for the people you know um, and the family members who are in difficult marriage situations. I'm praying for you that you would know God's love that you would not abandon hope, and that the Lord will bring you where he wants you to be. May Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.